we're in the middle, still in the middle of a struggle for our rights. And despite some advances that have been made, uh, that we have to continue the struggle. This week on the show, new economy or newly packaged neoliberalism? The leader of the National Taxi Workers Alliance says app-based Uber is crushing workers' rights. Then while it's possible to lose rights overnight, it can take a lifetime to win them as we hear from Esther Cooper Jackson, who spent a century in the struggle. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. The Global Newswire Associated Press this January announced that it will no longer refer to the app-based cab hail service, Uber, as ride-sharing. The move follows criticism that Uber and Lyft-type services are very far from sharing. In fact, they're moving in on rather well-populated turf and hurting other people's livelihoods. Uber, founded in 2009, is now operating in more than 50 countries and 200 cities. It started the year valued at some $40 billion and it's been getting a mountain of press, especially since bringing on as senior vice president for strategy and policy, David Plouffe, the former close campaign advisor of President Barack Obama. To rebalance the media skew just a bit, we're gonna give an Uber critic some airtime today. She's Bervi Desai, and she's co-founder and director of the Taxi Workers Alliance, New York's largest cab drivers union. Welcome, Bervi. Glad to have you back on the program. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. So let's get this out of the way. Uber, not sharing in your view. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> They're not using technology to democratize the world. They're using it to monopolize capital and putting out, you know, thousands of hardworking taxi drivers out of their livelihoods and luring in people really desperate through a recession with the promise of a job when in essence, um, you know, it, it's part-time work that they're really proliferating. But I know if we had Travis Koralnik, the CEO right here, he would say, look, what we are simply doing is connecting customers with a service they want. We are creating jobs for drivers. He's even got studies out there now saying that he's cutting down on drunk driving because of the presence of Uber. I think at the end it would amount to this wouldn't be such a successful innovation if people didn't want it. They are just such a big PR machinery. You know, first of all, the so-called jobs, their own study, which they came out with, 600 drivers. Now, for a $40 billion company, all they could manage to interview is 600 people. That itself says something. Um, in their own numbers, what you find is that the majority of the people are only putting in 35 hours a week and taking in not before expenses, they're grossing $15 per hour. So after expenses, it's much lower than that. I mean, in some shifts, it's not even a guaranteed minimum wage. And the majority of the people that are working, over 60%, are those that already have another job and they're going into the Uber market as really supplemental income. That's a, a bigger um, issue with our economy where even where, you know, where there's a bounce back in some jobs, it's certainly not at the level of wages and incomes that people need in order to survive. But it also means that, that the drivers or professional drivers are full timers. They're now getting pushed out of the industry. Mm. So, you know, simple mathematics, right? If you have 150,000 fares that are being divided among 10,000 drivers versus 150,000 fares being divided by 2,000 professional full-time drivers, you see the difference in the income per, that each worker is taking home. Uber, meanwhile, is still making money off of all 150,000 mm -hmm. fares. Now, the consumer, though, I know in a place like New York, San Francisco, where Uber began and other cities too, says it's just so convenient that you can just push a button, they can see the little thing telling them that their taxi is coming, there's a reassurance factor, there's a no-hassle factor that they don't have to get out their credit cards. Um, speak to the consumer for a bit, because they might say, hey, if your taxi was as easy to hail as you'd like, I'd be using that any day. <laughs> well, you know, Uber did not invent the software, you know, the, the app, the e-hailing app. That predates Uber, and it's, it was popular before Uber. What is really important to understand is what Uber has done is actually brought in a new economic model into the private transportation industry. So talk about that. 
that model, which they call quote unquote ride share, even though it's not a peer to peer economy, mm -hmm. um, and as you said, the you know, Associated Press no longer uses that term, what it fundamentally means is that any unlicensed private vehicle operator, so they don't have a professional driver's license or a commercial vehicle or commercial insurance, they are able to get jobs dispatched to them for hire using the Uber app. Mm -hmm. Lyft and Sidecar, few of these companies coming out of Silicon Valley have that same kind of a model. The reason it's so problematic from our perspective is, you know, 30 years ago, the, in, the taxi industry brought in the present day model of leasing, where drivers went from being commissioned employees to independent contractors with no you know, minimum wage guarantees, right to collectively bargain, any basic labor protections. Well, today, 30 years later, under this quote unquote ride share model, we're being told we're not independent contractors, we're just not workers at all. Mm. That you know, if you have some extra time, you can go out there and pick up some fares. But what about the fact that you have you know, hundreds of thousands of men and women who are relying on this industry for full-time work? Mm. And now we're facing unlimited competition from private vehicles. The consumer perspective should be even more alarmed because you know there's no real security checks i mean as you know in india there is a of a, a, a very high profile case of a woman who was raped um in boston and other parts of the u.s we've had such incidents as well so uber x which you know uber promotes it's 80 percent of their business Uber X uses private vehicles, mm -hmm. so unlicensed, no commercial insurance. In fact, in California, there's a case still going on in court where um, a little girl was killed in an accident and Uber has refused to take responsibility via their insurance saying, well, you know, the accident happened when the driver was not on one of our calls. Mm -hmm. And that's unheard of in the taxi mm -hmm. industry. Now, what Delhi has done in relation to that rape, that rape situation was mm -hmm. to stop Uber altogether. It, it is suspended service, banned it as much as it can. That's not happened in many cities in the States yet. Instead, people are talking about, well, let's think out regulations. What regulations, if any, would work for you? I mean, what if they were required to have the insurance? What if it, there were some other regulations? Would that work? Well, one, I, one thing I want to say is 35% of the countries and cities that Uber claims to be in, they've actually been similarly banned. And throughout Europe, there's been an uproar. You know, um, in cities where drivers are classified as employees and have, you know, certain social um, benefits, Uber has gone in and basically wanted to operate in this ride share model and governments have said you can come in but there's already a you know an economy here you have to operate as an employer they have refused in most of the cities where the regulators have come in and said you have to abide by the same insurance requirements for consumers as traditional taxis or limos that's where uber has said no and they've packed their bags and left mm -hmm. or they've just been outright banned i mean in south korea you know, uh, Mr. Travis has a warrant out for his arrest, and they, the government has actually said that if you see a private vehicle picking up illegally into Uber mm -hmm. car, they will reward you $900 for, for reporting these incidents. Now, the, the problem here is Uber is fundamentally anti-regulation. They are, you know, it, the, they are as neoliberal as you get. They claim to be new money, but they're as old money as capital gets. Um, Lobbyists, what are you up against? Oh, um, in, in cities like Austin, seven council members versus eight Uber lobbyists. That's what we're up against. You know, where they've hired regulators at the federal, coming out of the Obama administration or, you know, coming out of federal offices um, to at the local level who are, who are shaping not really the, um, the economic model of Uber, but very much the lobbying effort of how to make that economic model succeed. Well, it's certainly paying off in terms of coverage. I didn't, I wasn't joking about how much attention they're getting at the top of the show. In the last six days here in New York, in just mm -hmm. one paper, the New York Times, I found five articles about Uber. So they're getting a lot of attention. I want to ask you what in all of this conversation 
is useful? I mean, is there a part of this that's helpful for us to be considering at this moment? As more and more people are participating in something they consider to be the sharing economy, mm -hmm. um, as more and more people are, I heard somebody refer to it as monetizing their downtime. Mm -hmm. it's like, Oi. Um, <laughs> I think there is a conversation to be had about what the workplace looks like. And you've frankly been at the front of it. You're, on, you're an affiliate of the AFL-CIO, and yet you're an organization of independent contractors. Mm -hmm. You broke in to a field that was very heavily regulated and licensed and figured out how to create yourself a presence. Talk about what do you think is going to come out of this that's worth worth something more than just the fight? I mean, I definitely, you know, there's many conversations to be had here, but, you know, sadly, I think most of the conversations are about, are about really the erosion of work, you know? I mean, so in a place like California, where Uber and Lyft and Sidecar, this whole new economic model is, you know, really taken hold, you know, given that, that that's, their, that's their home. Um, Taxi drivers are covered under workers' compensation, mm -hmm. right? So if you're injured on the job, it's, it's one of the basic labor protections we've been, as a movement, have been able to hold on to, even as we transition into independent contractorship. Mm -hmm. But under this new model, you know, where you're not even a worker at all, you're not covered under, you know, workers' comp. You're Travis not covered says everybody, under Travis Karanik says everybody is an independent contractor or a small businessman. Which, you know, which is nice to say when he himself is sitting on a $40 billion war chest. I mean, this is the same company that says, you know, their drivers are their partners, but they don't exactly have access to $40 billion as partners, let alone a guaranteed minimum wage. I mean, there is so much double speak. You know, they are an incredibly aggressive propaganda machine. I guess my point is, though, that it's not just happening to taxi drivers, that this mm -hmm. conversation is happening all over. You're not an employee of Walmart. You're a private contractor producing. Mm -hmm. uh, you might be a private contractor working as a domestic in a home uh, as opposed to a hospital union nurse. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are trying to figure this out. What's your advice to folks as they consider what they should be, how they should be even thinking about their own work life? Well, you know, it's important. I mean, you cannot have workers' rights if you don't see yourself as a worker. And if you allow an economy to be driven by multi-billion dollar conglomerates that want to tell ordinary poor people that you're no longer a worker, that is a really scary movement in the economy. I think it's completely coming out of the desperation that people feel through the recession. You know, in the taxi industry, there is a desperate need for an alternative. But Uber is not it. If anything, it is dragging us backwards, not forwards. If you had an app, I know that's one in development, or the mm -hmm. city had an app, mm -hmm. would that work for you? Well, you see, that's the thing, right? It, like, they they want to say this is about an app, it's about technology, right? The good old line, just so tiring that unions and workers are anti-technology. Right, you're anti-disruption. These are disruptors. Yeah, I, I mean, you know me well enough to know <laughs> I, I love a good disruption, but I love it in the favor of poor people and working people, not where I, where I get to hear that a $40 billion company sees itself as some, side of, mm -hmm. some sort of victims to regulators. Regulators who demand, you know, that transportation service should be in compliance with, you know, the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. Mm -hmm you know, that who believe that there should be regulation or against, you know, race-based refusals, right? Who believe that there should be security background checks so people of all ages and both genders can feel safe being driven by a stranger. I mean, these are regulations that came into place through a long struggle by both private capital in the industry, but also by the workers. And so, and I think as consumers, it, you know, people should be really alarmed at um, having their consumer protections being gutted simply so Uber can make more money. And just to be clear, as the worker who's taking the risk here mm -hmm. in this Uber situation, who's taking the risk? Who's putting in the capital? Oh, who's it's actually providing the means by which this money is made? Usually in the trade right. and capitalism, the capitalist puts in something. Oh, no, not in this new model. This is the brand new world, you know? Um, no investments are necessary into the actual labor. It's, so the, the survey, the study that Uber put out recently claiming $15 per hour, you know, pay, and they're very clear to say that's before expenses. Let's talk about the expenses. 
gasoline, vehicle financing, vehicle maintenance, vehicle repairs, vehicle insurance. For uh, in, in New York City alone, a taxi driver spends over $10,000 a year just on vehicle maintenance and repairs. That's not even talking about financing, gasoline, inspections. I mean, all of these things add up. At the end of the year, your income is not going to be $15 or even $10 per hour. So what's your advice to folks who are standing on the street corner right now, perhaps watching on their iPhone and about to push that Uber button? Well, I think first and foremost, they need to say to their local regulators, especially throughout California, Chicago, Boston, Washington, D.C., so many cities across this country, that we believe in a, you know, regulation that protects both consumers and the workers. We don't want to see this being given away to the benefit of Uber. I mean, Laura, I was at a public hearing in California and then one in Boston. In Boston is a room full of 300 taxi drivers, ordinary men and women who'd been in this industry for years, you know, um, and like a couple of Uber executives. And that city council didn't give a damn that there are 300 working men and women taking time out of their shift to go into that public hearing. All they could do was, you know, es essentially cater to the corp, you know, to the Uber executives and the Lyft executives that were, that were testifying. And throughout their testimonies, it was, no, we don't share that data. That would, you know, that's against, you know, that we would, it would, we would lose our competitive edge. No, we don't keep track of that. You're a multi-billion dollar company, you don't keep track of how many vehicles you have. At the California public hearing, there was actually a commissioner who asked Uber and Lyft, so do you also give your, do you allow private operators, you know, private motorists without a DMV license plate to download your app and, and pick up for hire? And they literally said, uh, we'll have to get back to you. Final question. Last time I saw you, Bervi, you were just elected to the executive board of the AFL-CIO, the Taxi Workers Alliance is an affiliate of, of, the, of the Federation. Do they have your back on this? Where are they on this? Yeah, I mean, I think the labor movement as a whole knows that, you know, we're sooner or later, we're all going to begin to face this, right? I mean, the it's, you know, there's an economic impact of the Walmarts, and we see Uber as in you know, a Walmart on wheels. You know, when they begin to slash, you know, gut the 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 incomes and the protections of one workforce, it trickles down, right? Wealth doesn't trickle down, but exploitation spreads, and so this is very much you know a unified fight, um, not only in this country but globally. We're also affiliated with the International Transport Workers Federation. We just had a joint convening with the ITF. And later on in the year, we're having another one where, you know, what what this fight has done is taken a very local industry mm -hmm. and really globalized our struggle. And so um, within the larger labor movement in this country, I mean, you look at the impact of Airbnb on the hotel trades and ho the hotel industry is one of the few private industries that has, you know, a better average of unionized workers and a higher standard for labor. So, um Given that this model really is very much about gutting the rights of workers and consumers, you know, to lower the standard, all of us as working people, whether you're a unionist or you're not, but if you believe that working people and poor people should have a shot at a dignified life, then you must care and you must get active and do something about this. I think we're going to be hearing from you more on this, you and your <laughs> colleagues globally. Baravi, thank you so much for coming, and it's great to see you again. Thank you. In the valley on my knees, ask my Lord have mercy, please. Every time, Every time I Lord, moving in my heart, I will pray. Every time, Every time I feel the Spirit the spread moving, moving in my heart, I will pray. He came to Carnegie Hall in, in the blizzard from Chicago, and he said, his remarks was, well, it was better to be Dr. King late than the late Dr. King. And the sad part about it is the very next month, as you know, he was assassinated in Memphis. Uh, my name is Esther Cooper Jackson. Um, uh, the Jackson is from my husband's name. Both of us went through many battles of the civil rights activities. I had an older sister and a younger sister. There were three of us. 
Well, my mother had been an activist in civil rights all of her life. We subscribed to the Crisis Magazine all of our lives. The magazine of the NAACP, founded by W.E.B. Du Bois. In the early days, it was like the only publication that published anything about what was happening in black life. The crisis uh, had editorials on lynchings, on problems of blacks all over the country, the link with international struggles. Uh, and uh, we waited for it. We got it every month in our home. And we sat around the table and we would discuss articles in the crisis. Our parents, particularly my mother, and she said, yes, I want you to get as much education as you can. But I hope you don't think your education is just for you, that you're getting it just to advance yourself as individuals, but that you will know that you're getting it for, for our people. Jordan Reaper, Jillian Cole, Jill's the body but not the soul. All around me look so shine. Ask my lord if all was mine. Every time, Every time. I, I had... Um, been given a fellowship to go to the University of Chicago to work on my doctorate. And so Edward Strong and, and uh, Lewis Burnham uh, and James Jackson asked me if I'd come down from the summer, the summer after I got my master's, and work on the voting campaign. I know if my dad had been alive, he wouldn't have been opposed to my going someplace, but he'd say, well, why Alabama? Why go into a state like Alabama? It's dangerous. It was very dangerous. Mm -hmm. So I lived in a, in a, a housing project in Birmingham, um, and, but I stayed seven years. Not the soul, all around me looks so shine, ask my lord if all was mine. Every time Every I time feel spirit lord, is moving, moving in my heart, I will, I will pray. pray. Every time Every I time feel the spirit is moving. I first really heard Dr. Du Bois uh, in Washington when I was a youngster, when my mother took me and my two sisters to a church in Washington to hear him speak. Um, and his early works were in our home. We knew of his significance to the whole civil rights movement and to the country. Many people said that this would be an instrument for the struggle for civil rights, that you had to have a printed publication that you could put in the hands of people involved in the struggle. And this is the way uh, we thought of uh, Freedom Ways. I was a sociologist, so I, I wasn't really a journalist. But I always had a great interest in the written word. The black newspapers, when newspapers would not show the lynchings and the problems of black, it was the black newspapers who played that role. And these, like many of these black newspapers came into our home. Freedom Ways is the one place uh, in those years, 25 years, that shows a history of the, the civil rights movement, how it relates to the international movement, that portrayed the works of the great black women poets, all of them, many of whom published for the first time, Alice Walker for the first, published in Freedom Ways for the first time, her short stories, her fiction, we published first. And it, it helped to open the door uh, for some of the leading cultural figures in black life. In my heart, I will We're in the middle, still in the middle of a struggle for our rights. And despite some advances that have been made, through, and, and they occurred because of struggle and sacrifice, uh, that we have to continue the struggle. Are worker-owned co-ops the basis for a more democratic economy, not to mention society? They certainly could be part of it. Here's what we came up with, our special report, Own the Change.
people realize that their whole lives they haven't been practicing democracy. Democracy isn't something that you do once every four years. Democracy is something you have to do every day. Why isn't this history better known? It was dangerous, especially in the South. You could get lynched, right? Burn, your stuff could get burned. You could get lynched. For why? Because you were being either too uppity by trying to do something on your own or because you were actually challenging the, the white economic structure, right? And you weren't supposed to do that. The white economic structure actually depended on all these blacks needing, right? Having to buy from the white store, having to you know, rent from the white landowner, right? So they were going to lose out if you went and did something alternatively. And then they also lost power over you. And also, especially in the South, blacks in some counties were the majority. So the whites really couldn't, quote unquote, yeah. afford to let that happen. So there was fear of physical violence. There was also fear of red baiting, right? Right. Because of the McCarthy era, right, the fear of being called a communist. In fact, for African Americans, this, it was very serious consequences, again. Um, if you were considered a communist, you really couldn't work. Sometimes you were jailed, etc. So, and co-ops were considered sort of socialist communists.